us this afternoon. Thank you, Abby. Thank you for that introduction. Whenever I get introduced, I always feel like it's another person. Um, but I just want to make sure that my, my screen and my audio are okay. Yes? Yeah, you're okay. good. Great, great. So hi, everybody. I'm Anna Obasa, and I am here to talk about public speaking and writing letters to leaders. So before I give you the tips and tricks that I've learned in the last few years that I've been doing this, I want to tell you a little bit more about myself. So I actually um, did, did not ever think that I would be working in conservation. So, oh, why is my screen going? All right. Um, but I actually wanted to be a Broadway star. So my dream in life was to be a Broadway star. And um, for about 11 years, I was performing professionally, um, working in, uh, I, I, one of my funniest gigs is like working as an assistant for McDonald's in Star City, like singing beside McDonald's and then hosting a mall show of Totally Spice. So I got a good um, maybe over a decade of being in front of people. But in college, um, as Abby mentioned earlier, I graduated with a degree in English studies because I wanted to be a writer. Um, so these two backgrounds helped me um, give a, a good experience in communicating or, or telling stories. But really, um, now I work in conservation, and there's that, that can take a whole other um, talk. But now I run an organization called Save for the Bean Seas, and what we do is we want to narrow the gap between scientists and the general public. Because I don't have a science background, or I didn't until I did my master's, um, I realized that there's a lot of work that we need to do to bridge this gap between and among the different stakeholders. And we are passionate about three different things, engaging communities, educating them, but most of all, empowering them. And we also are very passionate about not preaching to the choir, but instead we want to build the choir. Because I feel like if tayo tayo lang yung mag like the environmentalists talk to each other, then we're not really going to move forward. So we try to get different inspiration from different um, fields, like skincare and makeup and you know we look at different marketing strategies of different kinds of companies because we don't want to be just your ordinary average um, environmental environmental uh, organization so uh because in the last decade or so i've realized that conservation has a marketing problem um there are so many good campaigns but not a lot of people know or understand or are empowered to, to do something for the environment. So then I had to kind of force myself to be the face of SPS of my organization and also use the skills that I have to be able to promote this cause. So in the next maybe hour or so, I'm going to give you some tips and tricks that I learned. The first on public speaking, and I know that I had to, so I usually give public speaking workshops, but I've had to adapt it because of our current situation. There are no in-person gatherings where, you know, I would be speaking in front of like hundreds of people. So I've also given some tips on, um, on Zoom or if any other online platform. And then I'll talk about writing letters to leaders. So why is public speaking important? It's it's a it's a necessary life skill, you know. Like even if you don't become a public speaker, yung tipong kina career mo yung pagiging public speaker or motivational speaker, there are going to be times when you present in front of an audience, and that can mean presenting to a boss, presenting in class, you know, oral production. I don't know if you guys still call it that, but when I was in high school, we used to call it that. Yung magagawa ka ng play, yung mga ganyan. So there will always be chances when you will speak in front of everyone, and the most important part is the prep. So it's so important to prepare, and I cannot stress this enough. So when you get invited to speak somewhere, or you're, you have to speak somewhere, not just when you're invited, you have to understand why you're being invited. What is it about you that made the organizers invite you? So that has to shine through and be clear to you. Next is you have to know your audience and your panelists. I never give the same talk twice. Um, I always tailor what I'm going to say to different audiences based on what I think they need or the background that the organizers give me. Because it's not going to match if you just copy and paste every single presentation that you've done. 
um, you also have to anticipate questions. So I know that after you know giving so many public speaking talks, I kind of have a good idea of what people will want to know and what people will want to learn. And the same with writing letters to leaders. So I try to anticipate those questions and already put them in the presentation. This is also really important. Know your venue or your platform. So in real life, if we were doing this in real life, I always ask the, the organizers, What's the stage like? Is it an auditorium? Is it a theater? Is it a gym? Um, is it open air? Because those are things that matter with how, for example, sound travels. So if it's open air, it will sound very different from a theater. Um, will I have a mic? Will it be handheld? Will it be a lapel? Um, will it be clipped on my shirt? Because if it's going to be clipped on my shirt, I won't wear a dress because it means the tech people will have to put the, the mic all the way inside. So these are things that that you know I've learned to ask. Um, and then when it comes to web-based, always ask for the link and then do a tech run before so you know where the buttons are and fix your lighting. So I'll show a little bit um, on this lighting thing in a bit. So let's talk about the materials and the equipment that you have. So in real life, always prepare your equipment. <clears throat> Will you use a laptop? And if, if yes, whose laptop are you going to use? I always insist on using my own laptop because I use fonts for my presentation that are not usually in ordinary laptops. And I get really annoyed when the alignment changes. I'm very, very obsessed about getting the fonts right. So I have, or if, if, it, I, if they have to use the laptop of the organizers for security reasons, I insist on having the fonts that I'm using installed and I have to check that they installed it. Um, and then I also bring my own adapters. Um, so I use a MacBook and MacBooks have different kinds of adapters, which is really annoying. Um, so I make sure I have the HDMI and the VGA. I bring my own clicker, so I always have this, um, and I even have a backup clicker, and then I have rechargeable batteries, oh, diba? Para hindi siya wasteful, para aligned, diba? Um, and then always bring your own chargers. I sometimes I even bring my own extension cord. Um, so the tatawa means yung mga organizers sa because I bring my own extension cord. Um, because you don't know, right, what the stage will look like. And sometimes if I if I feel like magiging sketchy yung venue, um, I bring my own projector. So I just have to make sure that I cover all the bases. So why do I bring my own projector? Because usually if I'm not giving a workshop like this, I'm talking about the sea. I put pictures of the sea in the background and the, the colors of this year are very vibrant and there have been times when projectors have like yellow lines or or a pink hue or something like that that can't be fixed. So I know it sounds really OA but these are things that matter to me and if it matters to me it will end up mattering to the audience as well. Um, and then for web-based talks, make sure your laptop is charged. And I know that that sounds kind of basic, but I've been to presentations where the presenter is like, oh, sorry, I'm running out of battery. Uh, I'll be back. Kasi magsha shut down na yung computer niya. So if I'm giving a talk like this one, my laptop is actually um, plugged to the charger just to make sure that nothing is um, out of sorts. And then make sure your lighting is decent. So my home office, I've, I've worked from home all my life, but my home office was not equipped to have um, talks during the evening. So without um, my 600 peso ring light, uh, my room looks very dark. And make sure you do a tech run. So for this, um, for, for example, for this talk, we met two times just to make sure that everything is working out in terms of audio, in terms of sharing the screens, knowing where the buttons are. And if you are doing a talk in real life, I always do one walk around the stage to check for dead spots. And I think that's my theater background, you know, catching up on me. And I walk around, I, I make sure that, or if it's going to be filmed, I also ask, like, where's the edge of the, the screen na hindi na ako kita? So this is an example of what my office looks like at night if I don't have my ring light. So sabi nung, someone messaged me na, Girl, hindi dapat can you see my screen? Dapat itatanong, can you see me? Kasi hindi ka na, hindi ka na makita. So that's what it looks like. So I decided to buy a ring light on Lazada. Um, and see, it's such a big difference. And it makes all the difference, especially if you want people to see what you look like and if you're required to turn your video on. 
Now let's talk about creating your story, which is coming from the presentation of preparing your presentation. I always want to ask myself when crafting a presentation, what do I want the audience to feel or what do I want the audience to learn when it ends? So the objective of your talk has to be very clear. Is it to take action? Is it to fund the project? Is it to raise awareness? Is it to get buy-in for your project? Get an approval, get a good grade. It has to be very clear to you because if it's not clear to you, chances are it's not going to be clear to your audience. So make sure you that's clear. I really get I really cringe when people say my job like my goal is to inspire other people. It's just gross. Like it's so self-serving. I think inspiring others is a byproduct of you doing your job well. So do your job well. Um, don't use jargon and name drop just to impress. So this is really important. I've so there. I run a, a youth program called the C Camp, and we have people pitching different projects. And you know they want to impress by saying all these environmental laws. And I remember there was one student who pitched about a Republic Act 9003, which I know backwards and forwards because I did a lot of work on it. And he was saying that he was going to teach people. Um, about it. So I said, okay, can you give me five uh, prohibited acts under this law? And he couldn't answer me. And it, it's just a lesson that you cannot talk about something you don't know because the people will see right through it. And I think it takes a certain level of maturity and humility to be able to say that you're not an expert in something and that you don't know. Um, I think, in especially in the Philippine education system, we think that the speaker or the professor has to have all the answers, when in fact, no one has all the answers. I always say that I'm not an expert in marine conservation. I am a student. I'm a student of, of the environment. I'm a student of the Philippine Seas. I'm a student of the people that I work with. Um, one of my favorite quotes from Shakespeare is, brevity is the soul of wit. And this is just a fancy way of saying that you have to be brief. It's a very Filipino thing also to keep stretching out a conversation when, or a talk when you don't really need to and you just have to keep filling in the time or use synonyms when it actually doesn't move the cost or the conversation forward. So if you can keep things brief, it's actually better because you get straight to the point, people remember your talk more, and it's just clearer and easier for everybody in the room. Now let's talk about visual aids. Um, I can give an entire presentation just on visual aids and color schemes and fonts, uh, but for now, let's just keep it simple. Um, I would recommend if you're creating a PowerPoint to use a minimum or no, a maximum of two fonts, but actually you can push it to three, pero parang be very discerning. And then you can maybe mix and match a sans serif and a serif font. So serif actually means dash. Um, so sans serif is without the dash, like the one you're seeing in my Times New Roman is serif. I don't like Times New Roman for presentations though. Um, avoid distracting and judge -ja transitions. I can't believe I'm saying this in 2020, but I've heard, I've seen transitions like you may fire, you mga ganon. Like, that's so 90s. Leave that in the 90s. Huwag yun ang dalhin sa 2020 yung mga ganyan transitions, okay? Either fade or no transitions. But if you have, if you have distracting transitions, nakaka-distract siya. That's why they call, they, they call it distracting transitions. So just keep it, keep it simple. And then don't put too many photos of yourself just to establish credibility. I've seen a lot of, you know, so-called experts because every slide, my picture nila, oh, I, I spoke in this conference. I went to this place abroad. I did, and it's like, okay, we're not looking at your Instagram page. Okay, we want to learn about the topic that you were invited to talk about. So if you want to establish your credibility, you don't have to do it through photos or by talking about yourself and making yourself the center of, of the presentation. Unless, of course, that's what you're asked to talk about. But otherwise, um, just make that like a supplementary kind of visual aid. And then as much as possible, have one main idea or topic per slide. I read somewhere that you shouldn't have more than six elements in your slide because the audience will think, parang, 
300 times more. They, they need more brain power to process if there are so many things on your slide. What to wear? Why does this deserve a special slide? Because it really matters. Um, always dress to impress. And, you know, people always say, it's the inside that counts. Sino nga lang yung mga nagsasabi nung it's the inside that counts when it comes to presenting or pitching. Because the way you dress gives an impression about yourself. And, you know, it's even worse for women who will always get judged by the way we look. You know, I mean, even if we don't want to admit it, it's, it's, it's life. You know, last year I gave a talk in... I gave a talk somewhere and I walked in with my hair pulled back and my eyeglasses because I usually wear eyeglasses. And the organizer said, oh, Anna, you're wearing eyeglasses and your hair is pulled back. It looks nice. You look smart. And I was like, but I am smart. I don't need to. Anyway, so but my, my point is that you always have to dress based on um, what, the, what the event calls for. So check the dress code. Um, when I was a kid, I went on a Halloween party dressed as a skeleton, um, and it turns out the theme was Disney princess. So I was not a good fit. And ever since then, I've made sure to double check the dress code and if there is also a color scheme um, that the... Now, because sometimes when you get invited to an event, you even get sent a mood board or like a color palette for you to look nice in the photos. So make sure that that... Um, gets addressed before you pick your clothes. Yeah, let's be honest, pag web-based, you can half dress to impress. So top up, pwede nang uh, ayusin mo, tas mag ano, shorts ka na lang sa ilalim. But if you're curious, I'm wearing jeans today because I was actually out. But siguro if I weren't, I'd be in shorts. But you know, the way you dress also dictates how you carry yourself. Um, so if you're wearing a tight skirt, then you'll also stand differently. Um, and if you are, this is something that I've learned, if you are going to uh, present this uh, in real life, you have to practice, this is something that I, I do, uh, you have to practice wearing the clothes that you're going to wear. When I did my TEDx talk, I did it in na, 2012, siguro. Um, I, I think for five days, I, was, I wore the same dress and a skirt and heels that I was going to wear because... Especially for women, if you wear heels, or men, if you want to wear heels, it affects the way you walk. So if you're going to walk up a stage, you want to look comfortable while doing it. So if I ever do it again, you know, I would I walk up and down the steps several times just to make sure that I'm comfortable. Hindi ako na do the last um, So that that matters. So I have a little secret. When I get invited to speak about marine conservation, I almost always wear blue. And I always, I almost always wear something that has an, a marine animal print. It's just part of like the branding, the look, you know, it, it, those things, people remember those things. People remember, um, you know, they'll say, oh, I love the, the skirt you wore to this event with a seahorse print, you know. So it, it matters and people actually pay attention to it and will remember. So I took voice lessons for 11 years. No, nine years the man. Um, and my voice teacher always said, practice makes permanent. And this is true for both good habits and bad habits. So he would always check my technique to make sure that it's correct, that I'm not damaging my vocal cords because nga, he says practice makes permanent. And if you do it over and over again, then you'll get better at it. But if you're practicing the wrong thing, then chances are it's going to make a, a that it's going to create damage. So time yourself and rehearse. If it's, I don't know if you're familiar with the Pecha uh, format, but there's like, I think it's 20 seconds for 20 slides. Um, and the slides will automatically change. So it's really good training on making sure that what you're saying is timed to what is at the back of your visual aid. But otherwise, um, most of the time, they are going to give you a set time, whether it's five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Um, so it's really important to respect what the, what the organizers have set. And then experiment on your pitch, your pace, and what words to emphasize. When I was in theater, we had this exercise where um, we were given the same lines, but we were asked to emphasize different words. So for example, let's just say, I love you. The word, I the, the sentence, I love you. It will mean very different if you say, I love you versus I love you 
her says, I love you. And just based on the different words that I emphasize, you kind of have a context of what happened before. So when I was still, you know, in the early years of public speaking, I would record myself and listen, and I hate it. I hate listening to myself speak, um, but it's just so important. And I also realized that I speak really fast when I get excited. And when I talk about marine life, I get excited. So I've had to learn how to pace myself. And then another important lesson is just to be yourself. Don't try to be anyone that you're not. Um, it's good to watch different public speakers, you know, watch your favorite TEDx or TED Talks and get inspiration. But in the end, you are the one being invited to speak. You are the one who's going to get up on that stage or be in front of the screen. And you don't have to pretend to be someone you're not. You know, if, if you are an introvert, there's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to be an extrovert to be a good public speaker. I think that's a concern of a lot of people. But the way you see me now is the way I am out of the screen, out of the stage. Like I'm the same person. And I think there has to be an alignment of your on, on screen or on stage persona and the one outside of it. Because in the end, you have to be comfortable with yourself. And then during the presentation, so we already talked about the preparation part. Now let's talk about the during part, like when you're there already or when you're about to present. Being nervous is okay. Really, it's okay. Um, and in fact, one thing I've learned is that you should be worried when you don't get nervous because it means you've become complacent or you've become lazy or you've become too used to something that you're starting to take it for granted. So I'm still, I'm still someone who gets nervous. Before this, I was pacing because even if it's just me in this room, I still feel like I have to transfer my energy across the screen. And it's harder now um, because I don't know if people are listening, if people are learning, um, but, but let's just hope that you are. Um, and it's okay to be nervous and to turn that kind of nervousness into energy. So gamitin nyo yung nervousness nyo and bring that to the stage in terms of the energy that you bring. Meet the tech people if possible. So one thing I've learned also from my theater days is make sure you get to know the tech people. Who's going to be turning on your mic? Who's going to be handling your laptop? Shake their hat. Well, now maybe you can't do that anymore. But, you know, get to know their first names. Um, and because they are part of the team that will um, help you be your best on stage. They will also fix your lighting to make sure you, you look good um, and make sure you thank them afterwards. And this is something, this is a practice that I do all the time. I go, you know, backstage after and I say, thank you, maraming salamat ko, like, tinulungan niyo ko dun sa presentation ko. And then when you start, introduce yourself again and find common ground. So for example, if I'm giving a talk in UP where I graduated, I will always say, you know, a few years ago, I was on that side of the classroom or that side of the screen. So it's important to establish that kind of connection with your audience. Adapt quickly and feel the room. This one is so much harder when you're doing it um, in, in the screen. But I have an example of, I gave a talk in Tipolog. This, I think maybe this was a couple of years ago or, or last year, but I, it was a room, it was a gym with 1,500 high school students. And I was the last speaker. Uh, there were like seven speakers before me. It was an entire entire day. And of course by my, and then everyone who spoke before me, they were just speaking in, in front of a folder or they weren't really interactive, I guess. Um, so by the time I spoke, pagod na pagod na yung audience and no one was listening, people were restless. So I was supposed to speak for, I think, an hour. And then I told the organizers, can I just speak for 20 minutes? And then I'll just, you know, Q&A na lang. Or, you know, let's like play an icebreaker or something. So they said yes. And so I trimmed like right, siguro mga 30 minutes before the talk. I was editing my slides to make sure that, you know, what has been said throughout the, throughout the day, what can I cut? what will these high school students be interested in based on how they've been reacting to the other speakers? So you have to be able to adapt quickly. And that comes from knowing your material really well. 
And then of course you have to look at the audience. If, if looking at the audience scares you, if it makes you nervous, a technique is to look at the tops of their heads. So it kind of looks like you're looking at them. But here now, um, I have to look at my camera um, and not the screen, because if I look at the screen, then my eye line is down. So I'm looking at the camera and hoping that you feel that I'm looking at you. Um, and then in real life, use the space so you can walk around, um, you know, but not, not to the point where it's distracting. Just make sure that you fill the space with your, with your presence. Um, but of course, on the web, it's not possible. So, you know, we just have to stay within the screen. And then other Hi, things. Hi, Merong nag unmute. Ano kaya? Okay. Okay. So, look confident. Fake it till you make it. So, even if you're not confident, just pretend that you are. Or, or give the impression that you are. Use your visual aid as an aid. Um, that's why it's called a visual aid, because you're not supposed to be reading off of the slides. So don't read everything that's there. Whenever, whenever someone, someone that I'm mentoring, okay, not just anybody, but whenever someone reads off the slides, I tell them, sana pinrent nyo na lang yung, hand, yung, yung slides nyo, tapos ginive out nyo na lang as a handout, di ba? Kasi why, why are we listening to you pa if, if you're just going to read everything that's on the slide? So what happened in Finhorn, I was invited to give a talk in the storytelling conference in Scotland. And I think three hours before, I'm so used to giving talks with slides because nga, like I said, I like showing pictures of the sea. And maybe three hours before they told me, oh, no one told you there are no slides, there are no PowerPoints, it's just you. Oh my God, I had a panic attack because I don't know how to speak without slides. But then again, going back to preparing and knowing your material, I had to rehearse really quickly. Um, and instead of showing them the photo, I had to describe the sea and what it looks like under. So of course, I have to add a little bit more adjectives. Um, I have to be more specific. So it's a good exercise also to remind yourself that the visual aid is just an aid and you have to know your material and your message. And then another big um, problem that I encountered, uh, I spoke at uh, the Conservation Optimism Summit and it was a really big event um, and I was really nervous and I, I rehearsed so much as in, as in I could recite my presentation in my sleep. What happened during my talk was that the slides started running on their own. So mag-isa yung slide ko nag-change ng pictures and I couldn't understand why. And it turns out that when I was recording it, I saved the timing during the last rehearsal when I was going through the slides. Does that make sense? So it was like me flicking through the slides, yun pala na save ko yung buong yun as a recorded time. So the video is somewhere online. I never wanted to watch it because I was so embarrassed. But but because nga, I knew my presentation backwards and forwards, at, at one point, so I tried to stop and fix it and figure it out, but obviously I couldn't. So at one point I said, you know what, just don't look at my slides, look at me, I am your visual aid, and then I proceeded. Pero basang basa yung kilikili ko na, as in, I was not cool inside, but I was cool outside. Um, so it's okay to hold notes if, if you are more comfortable and you feel like you'll forget um, some lines, then it's okay to hold notes. If no one laughs at your jokes and your punchlines, be a sport about it. Like, tawanan mo na lang yung sarili mo. I think what I'm struggling with uh, when it comes to web-based, I like feeding off the energy of the crowd or the audience, and I can't do that here. So hindi ko alam kung natakatawa ba sila or effective ba sila or natatouch ba sila. So wala, you just have to go blindly and trust that what is interesting to you is also interesting to the others. But make fun of yourself if no one laughs. Then you can say, ah, okay, ah, ako lang pala yung natatawa sa sarili ko. Okay lang naman. Um, but always remember that you are the only one who knows your presentation. So if, if you make a mistake, if you forget something, it's fine. No one is going to know unless sabihin mo, oh my God, I forgot that slide. Or like, oh my God, nakalimutan ko sabihin to. Balikan natin, you know. But really, I think a lot of people are nervous because they think they're going to make a mistake. And there's nothing wrong with making mistakes. That's how you learn, right? That's how you grow. 
So it's okay. And you learn from that and you improve. Um, and, and speaking of improving, after every presentation, evaluate yourself and look at, um, look at yourself and, and see what your issues are. So how's your body language? I've seen speakers do this the whole time, which is not good because you're, you know, it feels very closed off. There are some people who get really nervous with their hands, so they put it in their pocket. I've seen people who keep fixing their hair or flipping their hair, and it's really distracting as an audience member. How's your voice, your volume, your enunciation? These are things that you're not going to realize unless you listen to yourself. And yes, I know it's nakaka-cringe talaga to watch yourself, but it's an important part of your growth. And then what are your linguistic fillers? All of us have this. So you say, um, so one of my teachers in, in, in UP said that people have a tendency to start their presentations with so, which is incorrect because when you say so, it means you're continuing a sentence when in fact that's the first sentence. So ever since then, I've been very conscious about starting of how I start my presentations. Um, a lot of us say like and parang a lot um, as our linguistic filler. And there are also, I've seen a host start every sentence with all right. Like, all right, everybody. All right, everybody. All right, ganon. So, but, you know, you can put some variation into that. Um, and then look for feedback. My friends and I have this hashtag. My best friends and I have this hashtag with each other called as a true friend. So if you have a true friend who's listening to you, or if you can practice in front of a true friend, then do that and ask them and about what, what's good, what's not. And I specifically put here, decide what is useful. When I gave my TEDx talk, in 2012, one of the reviews that I got was like, Anna is a good speaker, but her presentation is like a 14-year-old girl's Tumblr. Because you know? I would use like puns, I would use memes. And I guess, you know, for that person, it's not good because it's not serious. So actually, na, na affect talaga ako. Tapos na reflect ako, na soul search ako na, oh my God, should I, should I change the way I speak and the way, you know, I design my slides? And then after a while, I realized, who gives an F? Like, you know, like, that's who I am. And I'm not going to pretend to be someone I'm not. This is how I am in real life. This is how I communicate with others. But what I took from that is, I just made all my visuals more cohesive with each other. So hindi na random memes. Dinesign ko na yung mga puns and other quotes in one type of style. So there's always something you can learn from feedback. Um, other lessons learned before I start, I jump into letters to leaders. I think, yeah, we're, we're good on time. Whether you are speaking for a thousand people or 10 people, give the same effort and energy. If Abby had told me that there are only 10 people who will attend this talk, I would have put the same amount of time and the same amount of um, attention to detail than having all 70 people who signed up, you know, coming here. It doesn't matter. I think where you never know kasi who's watching. Eh. And of course, that's your name on the line. So always do your best. And and for me, there have been many encounters. Like one time in the Pecha Kucha, event that I did, there were like very few people in the audience. It was a very intimate group. And it turns out the head of CSR of Globe was there. And that was in 2013. And, S and, and Globe has been supporting SPS for seven years. And then because of that talk, you know, um, and there was another event that I spoke in for Modest. Uh, this was many years ago. I didn't know anyone there. I went, I gave a talk. And then someone who worked in Modest moved to Disney, Philippines, and got in touch with me five years later and said, you know, are you still with Safe Philippine Seas? I'd like Disney to support Safe Philippine Seas. So we did do a couple of activities with Disney Philippines um, several, several months ago when we still could. So it's really important to just do your best. Public speaking is a muscle. It gets stronger when you exercise it. So, you know, people will always, people always tell me, but I'm not ready to give a talk in front of people. And I think, well, you don't know you're ready unless you try it, diba? Like, you don't know how good you are or how weak you are and what points you need to improve. If you don't try it, you never know you're ready unless you actually go for it. 
So that wraps up the public speaking um, part. And now let's move on to writing letters to leaders. This one is a bit quicker, but I will give a couple of um, examples at the end. So why write letters? Why am I, so my hobby, I always joke that my hobby is writing letters to leaders. And I started out writing letters to leaders because my dad, who's an environmental lawyer, he would always, if I complain about something, like why are, there, why are the lines in the airport so long? He'll say, well, don't complain, write a letter. So we wrote a letter to the airport management. I was in college at this time. And we ended up meeting with the whole airport management, the top management, because of that letter we wrote. And it helped improve some of the practices in the airport. So ever since then, I, I don't remember, I think I was in second year college or something. It became a habit of mine to write a letter. So why write letters to leaders? It's important to write things down. These are our receipts or how we keep track of the world and what's happening. It's also a practice of accountability. You know, like we always complain, we always say things, but what are we actually doing to address these issues for ourselves and for other people? Um, there have been many instances where I, where I write letters because of something that happened to me but it's because I don't want other people to experience that kind of negative experience. So it's a form of accountability. And also, I think we have to be considerate that everyone is overwhelmed with different things. And, and sometimes they don't really mean to forget something. You know, they just do because they have other things on their minds. And we're all guilty of that. So I think we have to extend that compassion to others as well. So what are the kinds of letters and messages that you can send? Um, you can inquire or clarify a rule or provision. This is especially important in a time where government regulations change every week, right? Um, and then you can suggest different ways of doing this. This is my favorite type of letter to, to write. Um, you can ask for support, whether it's for funds, for mentorship, whatever. Um, checking in on friends and family. We don't really see this as a writing letters to leaders thing, but it is, especially now, important to reach out to people and check in on how they're doing. And, of course, to give credit where credit is due. So, pat people on the back. So, first, find the facts. I'm only going to give five tips, and then I will give two examples. So, find the facts. There's a lot of inaccurate news and rumors. There was an instance a few months ago that parang na, na jario na, I don't know, someone told me that my friend's dad passed away of COVID. And, you know, I was gonna reach out to her na, tapos nalaman ko, buhay pa pala. So imagine kung nag-text ako, di ba, na parang, I'm so sorry for your loss, ganyan, yun pala, buhay pa. So it's important to make sure you get your facts right. And this is not just in, you know, personal matters, but also with, you know, with the spread of like fake news. This is so important to verify your sources and make sure that your sources are accurate and that you've done your due diligence. Two is connect with the right person. Because sometimes... So for example, yung mga issues natin with our service providers, our internet, or ano, sometimes pumipitik tayo dun sa call center agent when in fact they're just messengers and they're just trying to do their job but it's not their fault why you don't have internet. So make sure that you direct your feelings or your thoughts to the right person. Um, and search online or ask your network to make sure that you are connected to the right person. And now what's good is that there are so many avenues of doing this. You know, a lot of companies or a lot of people are on social media. And you can also, you know, just be smart about it. Like if you are emailing someone from a company May pattern yung email address nila, di ba? Like, usually it's like first name, last name, or like first letter of the first name, ganon, and then the company. So you can already have a guess of, of what their real email is. Um, third is to be constructive. I think this is crucial because no one wants to read a letter where you're just ranting. So present other possibilities based on your experience. I mean, really, if you want people to act, pissing them off, will not help your cause. In fact, it will do the opposite of it. Diba? Parang think about you and if someone goes to you really angry, maano ka, you're going to build a wall eh, kasi you're already parang aggravating, you're already being aggravated. And which leads to the next point, which is to always be respectful. 
So you can be firm, but you don't have to be rude and you don't have to be mean or aggressive. So in any situation, just always be respectful and choose your words carefully. Um, I, I can get very emotional. Um, so what I'm trying to do is when I write a letter, sometimes I just write it and let it out, then I'll sleep on it and the next day I'll review it and I'm like, oh, that was mean. So I, so I try to wait and then try to you know, calm my emotions down or I ask a friend to read it. So again, it goes through your, as a, as a true friend. And then express gratitude. Everybody needs validation and assurance and I cannot stress this enough. I really think that people don't give compliments enough. And I'm the type of person who, like if I enjoy my stay at a place or I enjoy a meal or whatever, I will tell the waiter or tell whoever is in charge that I had a great time and thank you for the, their service and the little things that they've done that made the stay great. Because we could all use a, a lot more gratitude with, with with each other and then proofread like i said earlier or ask someone to proofread um, this is especially true um when it comes to social media when you post things on social media because screenshots are forever and now uso uso yung cancel culture which you know is another topic altogether but we just have to be very careful of the things that we publish online sorry six tips pala hindi five but other lessons learned, letters may not be the only reason for success, but it surely contributes. And I have an, a, a case study, my personal story. And if you write a letter, there's a 50-50 chance that you'll get a reply. But if you don't write that letter, there's a 100% chance that, not, that nothing is going to be done about it. So for me, take that chance. I mean, I, you know, when people say, I don't have time to write a letter. Really? Pero isang oras kang nasa Instagram? Or six hours kang nag-Netflix? Pero wala kang time to write a letter? You know, like, let's let's keep it real. We do have that time. And if you are worried about your writing skills, I mean, surely there are people who can help you or you can Google templates online. Um, so for SPS, we've actually created letter writing templates um, on our website. So important questions to ask yourself, who do you want to write to? Why that specific person? Get that person right. What's the issue that you want to address? And it's important to establish also why it means something to you. Ano yung stake mo dun sa issue na yun? And then what do you want to say? What solutions do you think will work? And this is a sample, um, just an outline. Uh, I will give you an example in the end. So I just, I, I can share this slide, no problem, but it just says, thanks and extend the hand. Be realistic about what you can, what you can offer. So for us, if we, you know, if we write to a government official, let's say, I will share um, what the strengths of SBS are and what we can offer. But it's a bug, right? You're just demanding. Um, this is an example of my, my good friend, Chris Nang. He, this is at the start of the, the quarantine. Um, and he was concerned. He shops in Rostans. And he was very affected that they were sleeping by the stairs. Um, nalaman niya na yung mga ka, yung mga naging suki na yung sales people sa Rostans, nalaman niya that they sleep on the stairs kasi nga walang public transportation. So he's very affected and he reached out to the supermarket Facebook um, and within a matter of days, uh, Rostans addressed it. So they provided a shuttle, you know, and, and then for those who are far, they provided sleeping like cots inside the store. So, I mean, these are just, I love this story because I, I, and I love how, how Chris signed off. He said, I'm a very loyal customer. Um, and he reached out and explained it carefully and was able to, to amend, you know, to, to help contribute for the welfare of the frontliners that were that we are supposed to supposedly paying thanks to. So this is one personal story. I have many stories and we can talk about that more in the Q&A, but this is a story of um, a letter that I wrote in 2011. You can see that. My dream was to get treasure sharks protected. Treasure sharks are rare sharks. Um, I've been working on protecting them for since 2011. And I wrote, this is my hobby. I wrote a fisheries administrative order to protect treasure sharks. 
I drafted it with support from my friend and you know sent it to to the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources. I was 23 years old, okay? So I was not really an expert or you know I wasn't really established or whatever. Well, I'm still not, but I mean I really just took the chance. And as expected, they replied to say, um, we've already done this. Thanks for your efforts. It's a very long letter to say no. Um, and then there, there was actually, they actually scheduled a hearing for it, um, which did not go well. And, uh, and there were a lot of there were lots of things that went in and lots of negotiations. And I, I never gave up on it because it's something that I'm very passionate about. But this was my first attempt at getting this story or like writing a new story for, for Thresher Sharks. And then in 2017, they became protected species in the Philippines. Um, and again, this goes back to what I said earlier, that a letter is not always the main reason why change happens. There were a lot of other factors that contributed to this and a lot of work from other stakeholders. I'm not going to take credit for, for this, but that letter helped put threshers in the minds of our government officials. And we've never dropped the ball in making sure that thresher sharks are protected. So if there is any doubt in your mind that your words matter, don't <laughs> to drop those thoughts because your words do matter if you make an effort to let it be heard or let it be read. So I hope that this talk has given you or has equipped you with some tips and tricks about public speaking and writing letters to leaders.